All right, we're going to talk about uh, exponents or exponential functions today. All right, exponential functions. Exponential functions are of the form f of x equals a times b to the x, where a is the stretch and shrink factor and B is the base. And we're gonna have A not equal to zero because that would be a line, that would be a boring function. And B is the base of our exponential function and you'll notice that the variable is now in the exponent, that's why we call it an exponential function. All right, now, for it to be an exponential function, we put some restrictions on the base and the base can't be equal to one. Now, let's think about what would happen if the base was equal to one. Well, if the base was equal to one, we would get y equals a, and I'm going to use that as a, uh, a slider. We're going to add sliders for all of these, a to the x. All right, this y equals a times b to the x. Now, when b is 1, well, what happened? Well, one to anything, if b is our base, 1 to anything is just a line. And you can see that by uh, this horizontal line. So that's certainly not behaving exponentially. And the other restriction we need to leave on our uh, base is the base can't, can't be negative and the base has to be greater than zero. So the base is going to be greater than zero, but not equal to one. And the reason the base can't be equal to zero, or not equal to zero, but uh, less than zero, is that if we raise a negative number to a variable, like negative one to the x, that's going to alternate. But what happens when x is equal to 1 half? Well, what does that mean? That means that that's equal to negative 1 to the 1 half, which is equal to the square root of negative 1, which is equal to i, which is uh, a not real uh, solution that we can show on, on, on the graph over there to the left. So the base can't be a negative number. All right, so let's graph some examples of exponential functions. And I'm going to graph f of x equals 2 to the x. f of x, or g of x, we'll make it a different name here. g of x is equal to 3 to the x. h of x is equal to 4 to the x. All right, so let's do that. And um, I'm going to let a equal 1 for all of the situation. And we're going to let b equal 2 to the x. So I'm going to make this equal to 2. There it is. And um, what happens if I let b equal this on a different graph? 3 to the x. Well, goodness, this looks like it's growing a little bit faster. I let y equal 4 to the x. It grows even faster. They all are passing through this one unique point, which is 0, 1. Think about it. Anything raised to the 0 power is 1. And that's why it's going to pass through this, uh, the same point. The other thing that's interesting about this graph is that it has a horizontal asymptote. You know, everybody sees that we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which happens to be the um, x-axis, and I'm going to make this so you can see that a horizontal asymptote at uh, y equals zero. So let's let's discuss what properties these uh, functions have. 
First of all, we call these exponential growth. They're exponential growth because when you go from left to right, from uh, x equals uh, negative infinity to infinity, the function is growing at an exponential relief large rate. So we call them exponential growth functions. And uh, the domain, as you can see, is all real numbers. The range for all three of these functions is going to be from 0 to infinity, not including the 0. Um, the limit and behavior limits, the limit as x goes to infinity of our functions, and I'll just use f of x as an example, is equal to infinity. But the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x is equal to 0, which leads me to the next comment about these functions is about the symmetry. These functions are not symmetrical, um, not even, not odd, so they're neither. They're neither even nor odd. I should say nor here. All right. And since we have a limit right here that goes to zero, that implies we have a horizontal asymptote. At y equals zero, because one of the end behavior limits is zero. These functions have no x intercept. And um, the y intercept in the non transformed uh, function is 0, 1. These functions are increasing uh, for all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity. And since they're only increasing and never decreasing, we call these monotonic functions. Which means they only have uh, mono means 1, tone means uh, one tone, and then, so it's just the increasing only. These functions are bounded from below. The non-transformed ones. And as I said, that they are um, uh, have domain for all real numbers, and they are also continuous for all real numbers. All right. Well, now these are exponential growth functions. But what about something called an exponential decay? Well, what happens if I make that exponent negative? Let's say instead of f of x equals 2 to the x, I say that f of x is equal to 2 to the negative x, which is equal to 2 to the negative 1 to the x. I could uh, use the properties of exponents and make that change. And that 2 to the negative 1 is equal to 1 half to the x. And then these would be bases that are between 0 and 1. It's between 0 and 1 and uh, with positive exponents. Now, when I say positive exponents, I'm talking about this, you know, last case here. Because you can have an exponent that's negative. All right, what about if I make my second function similarly, g of x is equal to 3 to the negative x? Well, that's going to equal 3 to the negative 1 to the x equals 1 third to the x. And then h of x, I could make 4 to the negative x, which would be similar to 4 to the negative 1 to the x, which equals 1 fourth to the x. All right, now let's uh, look at our graph over here. And then let's make um, our x 
now. Negative. And when I have 2 to the negative x, I had this red one right here. And 3 to the negative x. And 4 to the negative x. You see, what's happened now is these functions here are called exponential decay functions, which means they have flipped and now they're reflected across the y-axis. All right. Um, similarly, their domain and range are the same. Your end behaviors now have flipped because let's, the, limit, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, as an example, is now 0. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x is now infinity. So you'll see how the end behavior limits now have switched position. There is still no uh, symmetry. Um, we have the horizontal asymptote. Still at y equals 0 because the end behavior limit is 0 over here. The, the y at x intercept does not exist. There's none. The y intercept is still 0, 1 because anything raised to the 0 power is 1. The, now the exponential decays are decreasing from negative infinity to infinity, still making them monotonic. And now these are still bounded from below and uh, continuous. I'm going to put continuous up here. So no, no discontinuities. Really nice, well-behaved functions. OK, so um, exponential decays are the uh, reflected across the y-axis versions of the exponential growth. And it can be fractional basis between 0 and 1 if the, the exponent is positive. All right, so let's play a game. The game is this. Am I an exponential function? All right, so let's play this game. Am I an exponential function? Let's say I give you f of x is equal to 3 times 2 to the x over 2. Well, does it follow the rules that we stated earlier? First of all, is the um, a not equal to 0? Well, that's true. And then is the base not equal to 1 and greater than 0? The answer is yes. So this is an exponential function. Another example, let's see, let's, this one is uh, 1 half negative 5 to the x. Is this an exponential function? Well, this is not an exponential function because the base is less than 0 here. I'm going to try to trick you up here, trick you up here. So what about this one, x to the 2 thirds? Is this an exponential function? Well, the exponential function has the exponent in, has the, the variable in the exponent. This variable is in the base. So this is not an exponential function. This is a power function because we're raising x to a power. And then lastly, what if we said f of x is equal to 2 times I'm not going to say lastly, I've got another example in my head, 1 to the x. And this is no, this is not exponential because b is equal to 1, and we can't have b equal to 1. The last example here is going to be negative 2 to the x. Now, is this an exponential function? Well, some of you might say no because I have a negative base, 
but you only have a negative base if you're raising the negative number to the exponent x. And in this case, if we use PEMDAS, which means parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, and then um, addition and subtraction, we have to do the exponent first before we multiply. So this one is an exponential function because you're going to raise 2 to the exponent before you multiply it by a negative 1. This is not negative 2 raised to the x. It's just 2 to the x times negative 1. All right. So we played that game, and I'm sure you guys won. So now, what do we do with these functions that we call exponential functions? Well, we can shift them. We can transform them. We can transform them left, right, upside down, and over the x-axis, over the y-axis, stretch them, shrink them, all sorts of things. So we're going to do some transformations of exponential functions. The good news is uh, I think these are pretty easy to graph. Famous last words, right? So I'm going to do the generic with all the transformations in here. So it's going to be a times b to the x minus h plus k. All right? And we're going to label what these things are. So a is equal to the stretch or shrink factor, things that we're used to. h is the horizontal stretch. I mean, sorry, the horizontal shift. K is the vertical shift. And that would be up or down. Okay? And what's really cool about the vertical shift is that this is always equal to the horizontal asymptote. Nice to know. It's also your end behavior limit which is nice to know. All right, so let's practice one. All right, so let's uh, graph one. I'll give you an example here. Let's say we're going to graph by hand f of x is equal to uh, negative 2 times 7 to the x plus 17 uh, minus 4. I tried to put some random numbers in there, but okay. Um, the good news about an exponential is they always have horizontal asymptotes, and if their stretch or shrink factor is positive, it lives above the horizontal asymptote, and if the stretch or shrink factor is negative, it will live below. And in this case, our stretch or shrink factor is negative, so this is going to live below the horizontal asymptote, which happens to be at negative 4. All right, so let's, uh, let's do a quick little graph here by hand. And I said that my horizontal asymptote is always the k, and that's the negative 4, so we're going to make this negative 4. Do these in increment of 2. So there's negative 4. And this is going to live below, but I'm not going to trust that. I'm just going to uh, plot some points. And um, I like to plot points that are nice, easy points to graph. And a lot of things are nice and easy to graph, especially if we were to make this, 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 this exponent equal to 0, which would mean x equals negative 17. When x is negative 17, which is way down here, this is 7 to the 0. And 7 to the 0 is 1. And negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Minus 4 is negative 6. So, 2, 4, 6. So we're going to be at negative 17. We're going to be at negative 6. And then I like to put in another number. Um, and the other number is going to be, I'm going to put in negative 16, because negative 16 makes that exponent 1. And 7 to the 1, 7 to the first is 7. Uh, 7 times negative 2 is negative 14, minus 4 is negative 18. So we're going to be way down here in negative 16. I'm just going to make this negative 18. 
And so what's happening with this function is it's going to be really steep here because it's to the negative. It's got a base of seven. And then there's my function. Again, it lives below the x uh, the horizontal asymptote because it's got a negative stretch and shrink factor. And um, the asymptote is at y equals negative four. And it has no x-intercepts. And if I wanted to know what the value was for the y-intercept, what would we do? We would put in zero for x. So we plug zero in for x. Let's figure out what it would be if it when it eventually hits this uh, y-axis here. Um, that would be negative two times mm -hmm. seven. When x is zero, this is going to be to the 17th power minus four. This is going to be an astronomically large number. So um, largely negative. So it's going to be way, 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 way down there before it ever hits uh, the y-axis. But that's how you would find the y-intercept. All right, so that's how you would graph an exponential function. And I chose one that had some wild numbers, but just to be a little bit different. Okay, now, let's say we wanted to find another, we have another problem type. And this problem type is for us to name that curve. So find the exponential function that passes through the points and uh, we're going to say we're going to put it in this form meaning it's not going to be transformed it might be only stretched now we're going to have two examples so I'm going to do through the points uh, 0 4 and the points 112 point 112 okay and so um, I'm going to use this form and I'm going to use the easiest point first. So the easiest point is going to be the one with the zero in it. So let's try that first. So using the point zero four, we're going to plug it into our equation here and we're going to get zero, I'm sorry, four equals a times b to the zero. Well, b to the zero is just one. So this is four equals a. And, I, and so I know that y equals four times b to the x. Well, that's a good start, but I still have to find B, and I can do that by using this point here. So now we're going to use the point uh, 112, and we can say then that 12 equals 4 times B to this first, which is just 4B. And so B is going to equal 3, and my function is going to be Y equals 4 times 3 to the x. Now, we can't multiply these together because PEMDAS states to us that we have to raise the 3 to the x first. And they're not the same base, so we're stuck with that. So that's our function. And let's see here if uh, those helps us out and see if we're right. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of these really quickly. Whoop. And I'm going to type in our function, which is y, oops, sorry, uh, y equals uh, four times, oops, four times three to the x. There it is. And I'm going to put our two points to see if it, if it works. We're going to go zero comma four. Oh, I like to look at that. And we're going to label that one. And let's plug in our other point, which was, oops, one to twelve. And we'll label that. And sure enough, look, our uh, labels show us that our function does indeed pass through those two points. That, that worked out beautifully. All right, now what about another example here that's a little bit more difficult? Let's say we're going give, to give you two points here that are not as nice as having a zero in one of them. Let's say we go negative one. 9 halves, we want it to pass through negative 1, 9 halves, and uh, 1, 2. Alright, the process is the same. Um, I think I'm going to just um, 
start off with putting both of them in because I don't think we're going to get a nice gift like we got here with b to the zero. So negative one, nine halves. We're going to get an equation here that's nine halves is equal to a times b to the negative one. And then using a one, two, we're going to get an equation that's two is equal to a times b to the first. And I'm not going to put the first there because we don't typically. All right, so my technique on solving these is since um, a and b will never be zero because if they're zero, then we don't have an exponential function. Um, I can divide these two. Now I can divide them because a and b aren't going to be zero. So I'm going to take two equals a times b, and I'm going to divide that by 9 halves on this side and a times b to the negative 1 on this side. Now, what what's really nice about doing it this way is these a's are going to cancel, and I can subtract the exponents on this side. So b to the first minus a minus 1 is b squared on this side, and then I can keep the numerator, change the operation, from division to multiplication and say this is 2 ninths. So I'm going to get 4 ninths is equal to b squared. And b is going to equal 2 thirds plus or minus. Now, I have to choose the plus only because the base can't be a negative number. All right, so I know that b is going to have to be 2 thirds here because we can't have a negative base and it be an exponential. And um, now I have to solve for a. And I can use either of the two equations, and I'm going to use the easier one. I'm going to say you, if 2 equals uh, a times 2 thirds, because that's b, and that was b to the first up here. And so a is going to equal 2 times um, 3 halves, if I flip that, and that's going to be a is equal to 3. So my function is going to be y equals... 3 times 2 thirds to the x. All right, and I'm guessing that that is going to be an exponential decay. So let's, let's write that. That's a fraction of the one. I'm going to change that to 2 divided by 3. And we can make a 3. And let's see, let's change our points to we had. Uh, Negative 1, comma, 9 divided by 2. Oh, that's, that's good news right there. And we're going to have a point, 1, 2. And sure enough, it does pass uh, through there. So those two points pass through this function that we created using those two points. All right, and so that's the name that curve and coming up with the curve given two points. Now, that's what you guys knew before you came in here on exponential functions. All right, but what if we did something really strange and decided to take those exponentials and put them in the denominator of something? The denominator of a fraction. Interesting is that we can create another function called a logistic function that has some of the qualities of an exponential, but some other interesting qualities. So if you would pull out this sheet, Discovering Logistic Functions, and either follow along or pause the tape and use your calculator to multiply these in, and let's uh, do some analysis on what these functions look like. If I take and I stick the exponential down here in the denominator, this fraction. All right. And this is going to be, if this is a negative exponent like this down here, it's going to be an exponential decay down here. So as x goes to zero, as x goes to infinity, this is on the bottom is going to go to zero. And as x goes to infinity, e to the negative x or negative infinity is going to go to infinity. So it's going to blow up on the left hand side. All right. So let's look at the graph. Let's say we have y equals uh, 5 divided by. 
1 plus 4 to be negative x. Oh, all right. So looks to me like the domain is all real numbers. All right, so we're going to put this down negative infinity to infinity. The range looks pretty clearly limited to between 0 and 5. And behavior limits. The limit as x goes to infinity looks like that's 5. The limit as x goes to negative infinity looks like it's 0. The y-intercept, <coughs> that occurs when x is equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, you plug it in here, we get 5 over 1 plus 4 times e to the 0, which is 1. So this would be 1 over 5. Uh, 5 over 5, which is 1. So it's going to be 0, 1. And let's see if that worked on our graph. 0, comma, 1. Yep, there it is, sure enough. And the asymptotes. Well, it looks like we have an asymptote at y equals 0 and at y equals 5. Let's see on our graph if that works. y equals 0. Whoops, I didn't mean to have a capital Y. y equals 0. We'll make that dash. And y equals 5. Make that dashed and also red. And it sure looks like those are asymptotic to 0 and at y equals 5. The increasing and decreasing intervals. Well, this looks like this is also a monotonic function. And it's increasing only negative infinity to infinity, which implies that it's monotonic. It also looks like it's continuous, and indeed it is, from negative infinity to infinity. And um, let's see, what else? Oh, it's bounded from above and below. Now, this one is not symmetric. It's not even, and nor is it odd. All right, so let's see what happens when we vary this a little bit, increasing the numerator to 10. What happens to our graph? Well, it looks like the domain is the same. The range goes now from 0 to 10 instead of 0 to 5. The end behavior limits are going to be 10 and 0. The y-intercept now has jumped, and let's put in 0 here. And if I put 0 in for x here, I'm going to get 10 over 4 times uh, 1 is 4 plus 1 is 5. So 10 over 5 is 2. So it's changed to 2. So let's change that to 2 on our graph here. There it is, 0, 2 at work. Our upper asymptote looks like it's going to be 10 now. Right, so the asymptote is going to be at y equals 0 still and y equals 10. And this is still increasing from negative infinity to infinity, still continuous, monotonic, and bounded from above and below. Well, that's great. What do we notice about the equation in the graph? Well, so far it's looking like the asymptotes, or at least it appears so to me, that the asymptotes are at 0 and at then whatever the numerator is. And the end behavior limits are the numerator and zero, the numerator and zero. So let's see if we can make a prediction here. What do we suspect before we even look at the graph, the domain of this next one's going to be? The only thing that changed was the numerator. So the domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity. That's my guess. The range, instead of from zero to five or zero to 10, it's going to be zero to 15. The end behavior limits are going to be 15 and 0. The y-intercept is going to go from 0, 2, which we had here. Let's put in a 0 for x, and we get 5 in the denominator, so this goes to 0, 3. The asymptotes, I predict, will be y equals 0 and y equals 15. And I believe it will still be increasing from negative infinity to infinity. So let's see if that comes to fruition. I'm going to zoom in on our graph here a little bit so we can see. So the only thing we're going to change is the numerator. We're going to make that 15. And I'm going to change my y-intercept to 0, 3, which we predict. 
and the upper asymptote we're going to make 15. Well, there you go. And sure enough, we did predict it. Now, what's interesting about these graphs, I'll make a little comment here, is that you'll notice that it grows exponentially here in the beginning, and then it starts tapering off as that gets larger. And it starts tapering off to whatever the numerator is, because the denominator, um, this thing here, e to the negative x, is going to go to 0. So when e to the negative x goes to 0, it takes the 4 with it, and it's 15 over 1 as x goes to infinity. So that's why it's behaving this way. Now, why do we study functions like this, which we call logistic functions? Well, in, in, in the sciences, uh, populations tend to grow very rapidly at first, utilizing all their resources. And then, as time goes on, they grow up to a certain point, and then they hit a limit to the number of uh, people, animals, bacteria in their environment run into a limit on resources and can only maintain a certain amount of population based on their resources. And so things behave logistically in nature. And so that's why we study these curves and we put the exponential in the denominator. All right, so let's see, can we all graph this one without a calculator or Desmos? We're going to predict, the only thing I changed here was the numerator is now 20. So we're going to predict the domain is negative infinity to infinity. The range now is going to be from 0 to 20 exclusively, or we're not going to include it. Um, the limit and behavior limits are going to be 20 and 0. And the y-intercept is now going to be 0. And this is going to go to 20 over 5, which is... Four, the asymptotes are going to be at y equals 0 and y equals 20. This is also increasing from negative infinity to infinity, continuous, bounded above and below, and monotonic. All right, so let's change it. See, on this most if we were correct. And sure enough, it looks like it's behaving as we expected. And, uh, we notice that the numerator is one of the asymptotes. That's what I noticed right away. All right. All right, let's, let's move on and see what happens um, when we change the exponent from negative x to negative 2x. Let's see what happens. I'm going to copy this. So I'll leave it on there. Oops. Control V, Control V. Okay. And I'm going to change this to uh, up here. We're going to make this one 5. And uh, this one 5. Just we have the same um, situation here, and we're going to change our asymptotes now to 5. And our y-intercept will be 0, 1, like it was before. And I'm going to make our screen look like this a little bit. So I wonder what the 2x is going to do to that if I put a 2 in the exponent. Well, the green one, what happened to our graph? Well, it's still... Continuous. It's still uh, monotonic. Uh, it's still got asymptotes in the same place. What happened is it grew faster. It grew faster. So let's change. Let's fill this out. Our domain is negative infinity to infinity. Our range is zero to five. Our end behavior limits are five and zero. The x-intercept did not change. It looks like it's still zero one. The asymptotes are still zero and y equals five. And it's still increasing from negative infinity to infinity. But what happened? The logistic function grew faster. That's what happened. And the same thing will happen here, except what changes if I change only the numerator? Well. The domain stays the same, 
The range now goes from 0 to 10. The end behavior is going to be 10 and 0. The y-intercept is going to be 0. If I put 0 in for x, it's going to be 0, 2. And the asymptotes are going to be y equals 0 and y equals 10. Still increasing, negative infinity to infinity. And I'll, I'll do it right here really quickly so you can see that the green one, if I change that to 10, um, and the purple one, where I change that to 10, see how the um, green one still grows faster when you have the exponent that is twice the size. And let's change our y intercept to 0, 2. So we have it on the right side. All right, well, that's pretty cool. So what happens then if I make my exponent, instead of 2, I make it negative 0.2? Negative 0.2. Hmm. I wonder what's going to happen if I do that. Let's use the 10 one over here because I've already got the formulas up on the left-hand side. So I'm going to leave this at 10. And I'm going to change this now to 0. 0.2. Well, what happened? It decided it was going to grow more slowly. But still has all the properties. Okay? So the domain is still negative infinity to infinity. The range is 0 to 10. The end behavior limits are 10 and 0. The y-intercept still 0, 2. They go through the same y-intercept. The asymptotes are still y equals 0, y equals 10. And the function is still increasing from negative infinity to infinity. Okay? And for completion, let's finish this side. If I change this to 5 from 10, the only difference is going to be in the range right, from 0 to 5, and the end behavior limits, and the y-intercept will be 0, 1 instead. Asymptotes, y equals 0, y equals 5. It'll still be increasing for all real numbers. And continuous, um, nice function, nicely behaving function. All right, so let's, what happens um, is that we have a name for this constant, the c that's on top of the numerator, and we call this the carrying capacity. And it makes sense that it would be the carrying capacity because it's how much of the population can be carried by the amount of resources it has. So C is the carrying capacity. The horizontal asymptotes are always Y equals 0 and Y equals C. The Y intercepts are going to be um, the point 0 comma C over 1 plus, and if you go back to the original sheet, I have it, c over 1 plus a e to the negative kx. And so if I let um, x equals 0, this, this goes to 1, so that we want uh, the, the y-intercept will be c over 1 plus a. Now, I don't memorize this. I, I um, just plug in x equals 0 to figure out what it is, okay? Now, another interesting fact is when these functions change concavity. Now, what do I mean by concavity? Concavity means it's either opening up or bending upwards, or it's bending downwards. Okay, so curve is concave up when it bends up like this, and it's concave down when it bends up it bends down like this. I also think of functions that are concave up as functions that can concavity. I know we had a problem the week on concavity. Uh, this is concave up, a function that bends upward. Now it can be a gentle concave up like this. Um, basically, I like to think of these as holding water. Concave up functions look like they could hold water. Okay. And if you were concave down, your function concave down, it won't hold water. Well, in mathematics, it's really good to know 
where the concavity changes. And on logistic functions, the reason that's good to know is that's when the, the uh, population is growing very rapidly. And then all of a sudden, it slows, starts slowing down. Okay, so it's the point of concavity on a uh, concavity change on a logistic function Concavity on the logistic function indicates where the rate of growth slows down. Now, okay, what's interesting is does it look like if I were to zoom out here, that the rate of growth might change at the same location, even though one is growing fast, faster than the other. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the rate of growth is going to change when uh, we are half the carrying capacity, which is at five. And if you notice here, uh, at when the carrying capacity, when you're half your carrying capacity, it does look like the purple curve is changing from concave up to concave down. And this curve here, the green curve, when the carrying capacity or 10 is divided by 2, looks like it's changing from concave up to concave down. And thus, its rate of growth starts decreasing at half the carrying capacity. Okay, so that's why concavity is important on a logistic because then you know when the tide is changing and the population growth starts slowing down. That's an important point to know how to find. Okay, um, the other thing about logistics um, is now we just had uh, the function uh, y equals 5 over 1 plus 4e to the negative x. But what happens if I were to make this exponent now positive? If I say, what if we have y equals 5 over 1 plus 4e to the x instead of the negative exponent? What if I change that exponent around? Well, if you think of e to the negative x, that graph looks like this. It's an exponential decay e to the negative x. That's a negative x here. All right, e to the x looks like this. It's an exponential growth. So what happens to this term here as x goes to infinity? This e to the x is getting very, very large, which means this is going to be 5 over a very large number, which means this is going to go to 0 as x gets really large. So I hope your instincts will, show, will tell you. I'm going to copy this. Control C, put it down here, Control B. And when I make that exponent positive, what happens to it? Oh, it became, this became, with a positive exponent, a logistic decay versus a logistic growth. And that is because we have the decay down here, and it decays. So when x gets very large, this term down here goes to zero. Goes this term goes to zero, taking the four with it, which means I'm going to get equal, uh, equal to five. And so the end behavior limits switch here because this is going to go to zero at the negative infinity end versus positive infinity end. So you get an exponential decay versus an exponential growth. But most populations grow logistically and not decay logistically. So you'll see most often the logistic growth. Okay, so um, try your shot at the homework and uh, on exponentials and logistic functions. And you can graph logistics pretty simply by knowing um, the carrying capacity and uh, the y-intercept. And you'll know when the point of concavity changes, and that's when it's at the halfway point of it's between 0 and its uh, carrying capacity. So that's all I have on logistic, logistic functions. So have a great day.